I'm a theoretical physicist. I work in a world of extremes, ultra low temperatures, ultra short distances, and in some cases, ultra fast information processing. So let me take you with me to that world this evening. Let's start with the everyday world. Everyday objects are large, are massive, and contain many, many particles. We call them classical. The quantum physics is non-classical. Quantum physics is the study of very small things, such as single electrons and atoms and particles of light, which are called photons. These systems behave in ways impossible for everyday objects, such as books and microphones and human beings. Quantum systems, as we've been hearing, are notorious for behaving counterintuitively. As Sophia mentioned, a quantum particle can tunnel through walls. A quantum particle can behave in some ways as though it were in multiple places simultaneously. And quantum particles can entangle. So entanglement is a relationship that quantum particles can share and classical particles cannot. Entanglement creates strong correlations useful for quantum computing. If a pair of particles is entangled, you can know everything about the whole while still being ignorant about the parts. Here's a glimpse of how that entanglement works. Let's imagine that some young physicist, let's call her Audrey, has an electron and her brother Baxter has another electron. The siblings can perform some operation on their particles that creates entanglement between them. Suppose that Audrey measures some property of her particle, and the measurement has two possible outcomes, which I'll call one and zero. For instance, Audrey can measure whether her particle has a lot of energy or a little energy. If the two particles are entangled as strongly as possible, then Audrey will have no idea about which outcome she'll obtain. Now, suppose that instead, Audrey measures her particle and Baxter measures his. Now, the two siblings can predict something about the joint outcome. In one example, if Audrey obtains a one, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a zero. And if Audrey obtains a zero, she'll know that Baxter will obtain a one. Furthermore, and here's the kicker, there is a measurement that the siblings can perform jointly on the pair of particles together, such that they can predict the outcome with certainty in advance. So there's something, some information that isn't in Audrey's particle, it isn't in Baxter's particle, and it isn't even in the sum of the two particles addressed independently. It's spread across the pair. When it comes to entanglement, the whole really is greater than the sum of its parts. Scientists and engineers are now leveraging entanglement in quantum information science. But let's start with ordinary information science. Across science, we measure quantities in units, such as seconds and meters. The basic, of unit information, the basic unit of information is called bit. One bit gives us the ability to distinguish between two possible alternatives, such as, yes, I will marry you, and no, I won't marry you. You can store a bit in a physical system that's in one of two possible configurations, such as you know, a thumb that's pointing upward or downward, or in our classical computers, in a transistor that has the value 1 or the value 0. The basic unit of quantum information is a quantum bit or a qubit. Now, we can gain information from a bit by asking one yes or no question, such as, will you marry me? We can gain information from a qubit by asking any of infinitely many yes or no questions. 
So a qubit has, in some sense, the capacity to encode more or at least different information than a bit. Quantum information science is the study of how we can use quantum phenomena to process information in ways forbidden for classical systems. Quantum information technologies, as we've heard, include quantum computers, networks for communication, cryptographic systems, and more. Quantum computers will be able to solve, in minutes, specific problems that would take even classical supercomputers many years. Today's quantum computers, while they exist, are small and very limited. Errors corrupt the computations constantly. The experimentalist's next big goal is to implement error correction, which will require significant advances in hardware. So many of us in the field expect that we'll take quite a few more years to build quantum computers up to their full potential. But an important application of quantum computers will be to research and development in material science and chemistry. One example concerns energy use. We invest about 3% of the world's entire energy output in fertilizer production. Why do we spend so much energy? Because we used an old technique from 1909. Bacteria, it turns out, can accomplish the same goal much more efficiently. But those bacteria use a molecule that's too complicated for us to simulate on classical computers. But the molecule is quantum. So a quantum computer can naturally be better suited to unlocking the molecule's secrets. Now, this is not a quantum computer, although it looks cool enough to be one, doesn't it? This holds a quantum computer, which fits on a small chip. The chip needs to be at low temperatures to support quantum phenomena, such as entanglement, which are destroyed by heat. So this device cools the quantum computer to temperatures lower than that of outer space. So this device is called a dilution refrigerator, or to those of us in the field, a fridge. Yeah, so actually when my husband heard that, he's a classical computer scientist, he was kind of indignant. He said, so this cools things down to below the temperature of outer space, and you don't even call it a freezer? <laughs> anyway, the importance of cooling leads us to the importance of energy science called thermodynamics. Thermodynamics is the study of energy, the different forms that energy can be in, and the transformations amongst those forms. Objects can transmit energy in two forms, heat and work. Heat is the uncoordinated energy of particles jiggling about randomly. Heat is disorganized energy and so isn't directly useful. Work is coordinated energy that can be directly harnessed to power a factory or charge a battery or raise an anchor. Heat engines convert random heat into coordinated work. Heat engines drove the Industrial Revolution by powering the first factories. So people started wanting to know how efficiently these engines could operate. So they developed the theory of thermodynamics during the 1800s, the Victorian era, giving the theory a practical spirit. However, the practical questions led to fundamental questions like, why does time flow in only one direction? Thermodynamic tasks include cooling and powering and charging. They echo information processing tasks such as computing and encryption. Now, we've seen that quantum phenomena, such as entanglements, can enhance information processing tasks. So can they enhance thermodynamic tasks? How would quantum engines look, and what could they achieve? More generally, how can we extend the Victorian theory of thermodynamics from large classical systems, such as steam engines, to 
small quantum and information processing systems. These questions underpin quantum thermodynamics, my field of research. Here's an example of what we can uncover at this intersection of quantum information science and thermodynamics. We'll see that an information processing task, erasure, costs thermodynamic work classically. But given entanglement, instead of spending work to erase, we can obtain work. We can store a bit not only in a transistor, but also in a gas particle in a box. Suppose that this particle is classical, like a miniature basketball. If the gas is on the box's right-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a 1. If the gas is on the left-hand side, we'll say that it encodes a 0. That's the bit. Suppose that we have no idea where the particle is. It can be anywhere in the box. Its position is totally random. Suppose that we want to reset the particle's position to the box's right-hand side, so a nice, clean state. This is like taking a messy sheet of scrap paper that's been scribbled on totally randomly and erasing it to a nice, clean state. To erase the bit encoded by the gas, we let the gas exchange heat with its surroundings, which have a fixed temperature through the box's walls. Then we slide a partition into the box near the left-hand wall and push the partition to the box's center. The gas ends up trapped in the right-hand side. At what cost? We compress the gas, so we have to exert energy, namely work the coordinated, useful type of energy that can be transferred between systems. So we spend work to reset the particle's position or to erase the bit of information. In other words, erasure, an information processing task, costs work, a thermodynamic resource. This statement is true even of the most energy-efficient classical computer imaginable. And what if we add quantum physics to this mix of information and energy? Well, the story can change in multiple ways. I'll share one way discovered by colleagues of mine, including the Portuguese physicist Lydia Del Rio. Suppose that we want to erase not a classical bit of information, but a qubit. We can store a qubit in Audrey's electron from a few minutes ago. Now, Audrey's electron can be entangled with Baxter's electron in some fixed temperature environment. My colleagues proved that Audrey can erase her particle's information while gaining work that she could use to you know, charge a battery or lift a really tiny weight. Now, this result should surprise us. I mean, we just concluded that we have to spend work to erase information. The trick is to sort of burn the correlations between the particles. Entanglement and heat together serve as a kind of thermodynamic fuel. So quantum phenomena such as entanglement can serve as resources in thermodynamics in gaining work, as well as in information processing. Beyond erasing information, we can build quantum thermodynamic engines, refrigerators, ratchets, and batteries. Quantum phenomena can benefit these devices, my community has found. We can use entanglement as a resource in refrigeration, we can charge quantum batteries at a greater power if we entangle them than if we don't. One of these quantum engines that burns, so to speak, information can perform more work on average than its classical counterpart. And quantum engines can operate under conditions in which classical engines cannot. 
These results not only help us extend Victorian thermodynamics into the 21st century, but also shed new light on what distinguishes the quantum world from the classical. Quantum thermodynamics reaches back to the past, to the 1800s, and head to the future, to quantum computing. So does steampunk, a genre of literature, art, and film, reach back to the past and ahead to the future. Steampunk stories take place in the 19th century. Some of the earliest factories are belching smoke. London is full of smog and Sherlock Holmesian mysteries. Paris is in La Belle Epoque. And people wear waistcoats or petticoats. Against these backdrops are futuristic technologies. Automata, time machines, flying ships, and submarines. The Canadian poet Douglas Featherling has supposedly said, steampunk is a genre that imagines how different the past might have been had the future come earlier. You might have encountered this steampunk novel, The Time Machine, by H.G. Wells. It's one of the first steampunk works. It was written during the 1800s. But steampunk is very much with us still. The invention of Hugo Cabret was a bestseller in the early 2000s. Enola Holmes was one of the first films released on Netflix due to the pandemic. It follows Sherlock Holmes's little sister, who's called Enola. I loved the film. This fusion of old and new creates a wonderful sense of nostalgia and adventure, romance and exploration. So fans dress up in these steampunk costumes with top hats and goggles and gears and gather at steampunk conventions for the sake of a fantasy. But this fantasy of steampunk is becoming a reality in quantum thermodynamics. So I call this field quantum steampunk. When I was a student, I read about steampunk in a novel. At the beginning of the pandemic, I saw steampunk in a movie. But this genre of fiction is coming to life at the intersection of quantum physics, information science, and thermodynamics. The fantasy of steampunk is becoming reality. Thank you. <laughs>